Morning. Thank you all for joining us in the for the second panel this morning. Um, we had a really interesting discussion in the earlier panel about the political and the details of the 25th July elections. I think it's really interesting for this historic moment in Pakistan. As mentioned in the morning session, there are 10 years of uninterrupted democratic rule, and now we're seeing the second transition from one democratic government to another. But at the same time, um, you know, as our Moid Yusuf here at USIP says, Pakistan is facing a schizophrenic movement. At the same time these historic elections happened, there were out and out election um, allegations of pre poll rigging, manipulation, intimidation open allegations at the military, judiciary, there was militant group and terrorist violence, including from ISIS. And so we want to spend the next hour or so focused on the non-electoral uh, aspects of these elections. And we have a great panel here to discuss these issues with you all. Um, I will briefly just tell you who everyone is, and then they can go into more detail. First, we'll have Yasser Qureshi, who recently completed his PhD in politics from Brandeis and is soon joining the Contemporary South Asian Studies program at Oxford University as a visiting scholar. And he will be speaking to us about the role of the judiciary in these elections. And next we'll have Josh White, who is an associate professor at um, Johns Hopkins SICE, and he'll be speaking about the role of religious parties and militant groups. Next we have Dr. Sahar Khan from the Cato Institute, and she'll be discussing the role of the military, which I know we had a a lot of questions about in the first panel. And uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Neil Siddiqui, who's Assistant Professor of Political Science at SUNY Albany, and is also a USIP research partner, working with us on violence in Karachi, and she'll be talking more generally about election violence. Each of our panelists will speak for about 10 or 12 minutes, and then hopefully we can all engage in an interesting conversation. So, go ahead, Yasser. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. It's great to be part of this panel. And I think it's safe to say that, you know, in the months leading up to the elections, the Pakistani courts took center stage. Um, you know, judges and courts dominated headlines. Their image was plastered across the screens. I think one op-ed described the period as the, ju the judicialization of everything in Pakistan at the time. And in this brief discussion, I'll uh, discuss the, you know, expanding role the judiciary has sought to play, how this role manifested in its actions, how it legitimized this role and what impact it had on the election. And finally, what challenges this poses to the post-election order. So in the aftermath of the clash between the Supreme Court and General Musharraf in 2007, which was backed by the lawyers' movement that I think Sahar referred to in the previous uh, uh, panel, the judiciary now sees itself as a major political stakeholder and seeks to play the role of a guardian of the political system. So after that clash, it now seeks to play essentially a similar role to the military, an arbiter and overseer of Pakistan's political system, checking corruptions and excesses by Pakistan's political uh, power centers, and essentially an institution that is allegedly beyond corruption and can bring governance to the country. At least that is the self-conception it's operating under. And this realizes itself in two types of actions. One is intervening in leadership selections, and the other is the judicialization of governance. So on the question of leadership selection, um, uh, the, the, the court acts on Article 62 and 63, which have made a lot of news lately, which um, basically set the conditions for qualifying to run for elections and being a member of parliament. And Article 62 sets up a vague standard of morality and sagacity, which the courts have in, interpreted broadly to grant themselves powers to disqualify political leaders who they deem to fall short of these judicially determined standards. And in recent months and years, they've been actively using this power to disqualify candidates and parliamentarians who they deem corrupt, even even from political office, the most famous, of course, being Nawaz Sharif, but several others suffered the same fate in the last year as well. And they've, they heightened the stakes by making this a lifetime disqualification. The other is the judicialization of governance. So driven by the same logic of combating corruption, the judiciary has also intervened in many aspects of governance by the executive. So under Article 184.3 of the Constitution, the Supreme Court can intervene directly 
without even a petition necessary in matters related to fundamental rights that also are said to affect the national public interest. And of course, being the interpreter of the Constitution, they get to interpret what affects the public interest very broadly. And the court has done this to allow to intervene in all manners of governance, including challenging bureaucratic appointments, questioning government officials on corruption, prescribing judicially determined targets for particular policy reforms and policy interventions and results. And the courts have clearly moved beyond any procedural or previously determined understanding of the separation of power. And in doing so, they're acutely aware and conscious of their political standing and legitimacy and popularity. And, you know, we've seen this in the past in Pakistan that throughout our history, unelected institutions have justified their interventions in Pakistan's politics and regulation of its political parties on the grounds of, a, uh, of uh, you know, as being necessitated by the uh, corruption and mismanagement of, of the political parties. So the military has always used its doctrine of necessity to, to explain its interventions into the political system. And the judiciary articulates a similar doctrine of judicial necessity to justify its movement beyond the separation of powers to take on legislative and executive functions. And this is made clear in the language used by the judiciary in its decisions that clearly reflects this anti-corruption mission and plays on an anti-elitism elitism and a presumption of corruption by Pakistan's political elite. In the famous Panama judgment, Justice Kosa opened the judgment with the line, behind every great fortune there is a crime, right? That's this presumption of guilt that pervades their judgment. And he later articulates the mission of the judiciary as cleansing the fountainhead of Pakistani politics as this may trickle down to the rest of state and society. Society. So really, this is this anti-corruption mission and role that they're articulating to explain their expanding power. And in doing so, the courts are acutely aware of maintaining the legitimacy of the expanding power and managing the optics of this role. So in this, they're guided by, I think, three principles. One, prioritizing the norms and, and the preferences of Pakistan's most vocal groups, namely the urban, middle, and upper middle classes. Two, aligning with the issues that gain the most coverage in favorable coverage in the, in the news media. And three, accommodate the concerns of the political actor best equipped to undermine their authority and leg legitimacy, namely the military. So avoiding challenging the military. And what this means in practice is that they will therefore expand their power on issues that matter to and resonate with the middle and upper middle classes and gain favorable co coverage from the media and on which they don't expect the military to oppose them. And we see this careful management of optics in the way the courts try to, in the run up to the election, present themselves as anti-corruption, but not anti-democracy. So take, for example, there was this case that came up regarding election forms. So in 2017, the legislature under PMLN passed an election law that removed the requirement for candidates to declare income tax on assets and liabilities in their forms when running for elections. Um, these declarations have been the basis of the Article 62 and 63 cases through which the, the courts have been challenging and disqualifying candidates. So just months before the election, the Lahore High Court ruled that these forms needed to be reprinted with that declaration included and those details included again. This raised the likelihood that the elections would have to be de delayed to accommodate this concern for, of reprinting. And speculation grew that the judiciary was trying to delay the elections and, you know, that the judiciary was acting anti-democratically. Chief Justice Nisar was keen to avoid this sort of labeling, and he repeatedly made statements on how they would ensure the elections were held on time and overruled the High Court, saying that the election forms would not be reprinted, but what, was in, but what he did was add a, ask candidates to attach a separate affidavit declaring these same declarations. So here, what's interesting about these optics, the court could claim they ensured the elections were held on time, and thus were not anti-democratic, but they also, by adding the affidavit now, would directly be able to hold candidates in criminal contempt of court for misdeclarations of assets, because this would constitute perjury. Uh, so this allows the court to take more aggressive action in these cases without appearing anti-democratic. And this is how the courts carefully balance these optics. And so throughout this period, we've seen the courts have been managing these optics, and the court has essentially become a spectacle. Chief Justice Assar routinely halts in public officials and politicians, give them very public dressing downs, choosing officials who, you know, would have very little sympathy with the class, with, you know, the up, urban middle and upper middle classes, and then generating media coverage for the way that put, he puts them in place. Um, I, you know, I've attended some of his sessions, and he'd begin his session by discussing newspaper articles remarks on what the court had been doing in the previous weeks, as, you know, this is the uh, extent to which the court has become so cognizant and wary of the way the media covers them and the conversation and the optics that they're, you know, presenting to their, their you know, the middle classes. 
And these actions of the judiciary played a decisive role in shaping the electoral landscape in two critical ways. So one is, it would be hard to say that the PMLN did not bear the brunt of the court's anti-corruption disqualification zeal. So from Nawaz Sharif to several other major political figures of the party being disqualified from running through Article 62 and 63 cases, um, this was the primary vehicle in which the PMLN was weakened by the courts uh, in this period. And it made sense from their perspective to choose the Sharifs as a target, since um, they had been dogged by corruption allegations for many years. They were known for their lavish lifestyle. And there was very few people in the middle and upper middle classes who would doubt or question that there was corruption behind their wealth and their and in their history. And further, you know, the media covered these very actively. And also the military wanted to see uh, you know, Nawaz Sharif weakened or removed. They clearly were not close allies or friends, so it would make sense if you want to expand your power to choose the Sharifs and the PMLN as a target against which to exercise and expand your role in the political system. And, um, you know, so in this targeting, the, the, the like, you know, one case really um, how would I say, emphasize the way this targeting was, very, was very, how targeted this was against the PMLN. And this was the case of the, the a corruption scandal regarding the distribution of ephedrine. And several politicians from several major political parties were implicated in the scandal. But while all the other major political figures were given, were put out on bail, the only one who was tried in the run-up to the election and sentenced to life was the one PMLN member of that scandal, Hanif Abbasi. And, you know, it's hard not to see a targeted uh, you know, operation, uh, t uh, them targeting the PMLN through actions like this. And it goes beyond this also by bringing PMLN figures before the court, dressing them down, rebuking them, holding them in contempt of court for their statements in the media. The, 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 the Supreme Court basically really made, out, made the PMLN out to be the target of their action and really used their pulpit to push back against the party and delegitimize them. The second way was that the courts crucially shaped the narrative in the run-up to the election. So. As the judiciary continued its judicialization of governance, its actions dominated the headlines, and its focus was primarily on political corruption and public service delivery. So these corruption cases, along with, you know, the, the judges' focus on hospitals, uh, hospitals, schools, healthcare, all issues on which, um, you know, corruption and public service delivery were all issues on which the PTI benefit, because that was their primary appeal and platform. We will tackle corruption, we will improve delivery of services like uh, public health and education. And these were exactly the issues, essentially the courts were playing a role of setting the agenda of the conversation on the media and in the coverage in the months leading up to the elections. By focusing on these issues, by talking about these, by bringing in these cases and making the headlines about these issues, they were shaping the narrative in the month leading up to the election in a way that inadvertently benefited the PTI, because they had built their own platform on the very issues the Supreme Court was bringing focus on. So there was sort of this inadvertent, I wouldn't say deliberate, coalition or convergence of interest between the two. As the judiciary board delegitimized the PMLN and gave the narrative of the PTI a boost in the run-up to the election. But now, in finally, in the aftermath of the election, the question remains, how will these two institutions deal with each other, right? Um, the PTI and the, and the, and the judiciary, because given that the judiciary, the military, and the PTI have all sort of built and expanded their power on the basis of this anti-corruption mission, how will they all seek to uh, maintain and expand their space to carry out this mission on their own terms? Will the PTI and the courts clash or, as the courts continue to check appointments made by the government? There have already been several cases come up where the courts have picked up cases regarding MPA, MPA members and police appointments made by the PTI. Will, the, will this alignment diminish? That remains to be seen. And furthermore, in the aftermath of the election, thousands of cases regarding the elections will now be heard by election tribunals that at the time are primarily staffed by serving judges, so judges who serve under the Supreme Court and under the uh, Chief Justice Sark and Nassar. And thus, the legitimacy of these elections and PTI's victory will be in the hands, in many ways, of these judges, given the, I think there are over 80 to 100 NA seats upon which petitions are going to be heard by the election tribunals. So in managing their relationship in the future, both sides will have to carefully manage the optics to ensure that in challenging each other, if they do, they do not undermine their own legitimizing narrative as fighting corruption and misgovernance. And, and I think, you know, it's unclear right now how this, you know, these, these institutions building their appeal on the same grounds will inter interact with each other in the upcoming future. So. Thanks so much, Esther. That's very interesting, especially the media circus. Uh, comments about judiciary. Josh, please. Um, Josh will be talking to us, as I said, about religious parties and militant groups. Thank you. It's uh, it's great being here. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to be at this 
session for a couple reasons. Uh, one is that I am a, an alum of the USIP Jennings Randolph uh, Peace Scholars Program, so I had spent some time here and I'm excited about what USIP is doing. Uh, and second, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be at a DC conference panel where we have not discussed the US-Pakistan relationship or the trust deficit. Um, so I feel refreshed, and you should as well, uh, by the, the sheer political nerdiness of these conversations, um, but the relevance of these topics to the future of, of Pakistan itself. Uh, my job here is to talk about Islamic politics and also to help all of you at home who are trying to fill out your Pakistan on acronym bingo of various parties and various uh, various political dynamics. We'll, I'll try to try to support that. Um, when it comes to the role of Islamic parties in this recent general election, the headline has been that the Islamic parties performed poorly in the election, uh, and that is true. Uh, they won only 12 National Assembly seats, about 4% of the total seats. They only won about 10% of the provincial seats in Khair Pakhtunkhwa, 16% in, in Balochistan, and negligible amounts in the other provincial assemblies. And some of the high profile parties that I will talk about, uh, like the uh, Tariq al Pakistan, the Lashkari Taiba linked uh, Allah Akbar Tariq, they got no assembly seats uh, in the National Assembly and did not do very well. All of this is true. Um, it's also true that behind this top line observation, there are, I think, some other interesting things that could be said about the role of these parties and what we can see in the uh, in their campaigning and in, in the data. So I, I want to put forward four observations uh, beyond the top line that they didn't do very well. Uh, and the first of these observations is that there was a noticeable disconnect between the popular vote for religious parties overall and the number of seats that they received. If you look at the percentage of votes cast for National Assembly seats for religious parties broadly defined, uh, you know, their high water mark is, is seen to be in 2002, where there was a favorable geopolitical environment and the MMA coalition uh, did quite well. They received about 11.4% of the vote. Uh, it went downhill from there. In 2008, they only got 2.2 percent because the Jamaati Islami, one of the large constituent parties of the alliance, boycotted. Uh, and then in 2013, uh, the two major parties together got about 5.5 percent of the vote. In this recent election in 2018, uh, the religious parties broadly were up to about 9.5 percent of the vote. And so it raises the question, so why didn't they get very many seats? Uh, and the reason is that there, the short reason is that there was a new uh, actor on the scene, the TLP, which I'll talk about a little later, and the religious party vote uh, really split between the old guard, the MMA, and this new uh, movement of the TLP, each of which got, you know, between 2.2 and 2.5 million votes. And the reason that the votes didn't translate into seats, there are several complicated reasons. The simple one is probably that uh, they had very different geographic constituent bases, with the MMA being strong in KP and in Balochistan, and the TLP having some, some modest strength, at least in vote, uh, in terms of raw votes in Punjab and in Sindh. And in a first-past-the-post electoral system, unless you can concentrate your voting power, you're not going to get seats. Um, so the first simple story is that the top line of the percentage of people voting for religious party candidates uh, was uh, relatively high compared to their uh, historical baseline, uh, but it didn't translate into to very many seats. That would be my, my first observation. The second is that there were important changes and developments within the old guard, within the MMA, uh, the, uh, the reconstituted alliance of uh, Islamic political parties led by the uh, JUIF and the JI, the Jamaat Islami. And again, this alliance dates to 2002, has been an on-again, off-again kind of relationship, particularly between these two major parties. And what happened in the 2018 election is that the Jamaat Islami generally employed 
imploded. That's the political science term, I think, imploded. Um, they did very poorly. They got uh, an M&A from Chitral, which is, uh, to say the least, a liminal area um, in Pakistan. Uh, they pulled in an MPA from another remote area, and uh, they did poorly across the board. Their uh, emir, their leader, lost his MPA seat. Their election management and candidate selection was bungled um, across the board, um, and they did, they did very poorly. I'm going to speak a little later as to one reason why this may have happened beyond simply uh, bungling uh, some of the uh, pre-election management, uh, but they did not play this well. The, the JUIF, by contrast, uh, had made an attempt beginning a couple years ago to try to expand their tent, um, looking ahead, I think, to this 2018 election. So they, they worked hard in Balochistan to reintegrate a faction that had broken away some time ago, the Nazareti, the ideological faction, which was not ideological, surprise, surprise, um, uh, to bring them back into the fold. And as a result, the JUIF did rather well in Balochistan. But if you look at the map of where they won seats in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, they were really pushed into the tribal areas, the areas bordering the tribal areas, and did very poorly in the urban areas, the Peshawar Valley, and over to the east, where in previous years they'd had some strength. So they were geographically constrained, uh, and they, even though they did their best in Balochistan to pull um, to pull some of these folks back together. The leader of the JYF, Fazl Rahman, also lost his, uh, his election, which was unfortunate for him, although thankfully his son won the MNA election, so it's still in the family. Um, I think if you're the, this also raises questions if you're the JUIF about what good the Jamaati Islami is for you in an alliance, because the JI was mostly dead weight in this election, and I think it will raise questions in the future, both for, for by-elections and the next general election, as to whether the JUIF would have done better if it had if it had not had to divide up the seats that it was contesting with an alliance partner. I'll also note that the, the MMA came in second place in 25 seats nationally. So they were modestly competitive um, broadly. A lot of those were, were JUIF candidates. So that's the second point, changes within the old guard of the MMA. The, the third, and I think this is really perhaps the most important point, although it's less empirical, is that it strikes me that on issues of Islam and politics, the policy entrepreneurship frontier has really shifted over the last few years, which is to say, you can see this on a few levels. You can see, first of all, that Imran Khan arguably occupies a lot of the rhetorical space now that was once dominated by the MMA, by the re religious parties. If you think about the discourse on Islamic law and society, on a, a range of social issues, on uh, sort of Islamic populism, on skepticism of the West, on sympathy for the Taliban, on a Pashtun vision of how Afghanistan, Pakistan cross-border operations should work. You can go down the list of policy issues and sort of issues of political discourse, and the mainstream has, uh, has crowded out that space where the religious parties used to be. What was once boundary-pushing behavior by the MMA now looks rather stale and status quo because it's been taken over. Uh, and some of these things, you know, in some of these cases, the issues have just fallen off the radar because the issue of the West is not as salient as it was even a few years ago, given the changing U.S. relationship with Pakistan. But I think what, what's important to see is that the policy entrepreneurs in this space uh, are now other groups, like the, the TLP. Um, and this is a Barelvi group, uh, you may remember, the assassination of Salman Tassir in 2016 that led to uh, this movement, the Tariq al Ya Rasulallah, which led to a political party that champions um, protecting the prophet from, from blasphemy. Uh, and this group, which has endorsed vigil vigilantism at times, has pushed the policy envelope. It has pushed the policy envelope both on domestic policy and the way that blasphemy is treated, uh, foreign policy and Pakistan's relationship with the Netherlands. You know, there are a number of issues where it is now the uh, the policy entrepreneur. In this election, the TLP 
got a, a number of votes that surprised a number of people, uh, but it couldn't translate them into very many seats. It didn't get any National Assembly seats, only one was even a close race. Um, in the provincial seats in which they chose to contest, their median vote share was in Balochistan 1%, in KP 2%, in Punjab 5%, and in Sindh about 7%. So uh, they, w they gained two seats in uh, Karachi um, and came in second place in about five seats and they displaced some of the PM, some of the MQM vote. Um, so there's some signs that they were carving out some space for, for themselves, but still it, quite in a tentative way. Uh, there were a number of newspaper articles that said, well, if you look at all of the close races in Punjab and in Sindh, and you see uh, the margin of victory in those races, and then you look at the number of votes that TLP got, uh, if TLP wasn't in the race, then this vote would have gone the other way. And it, so TLP took votes away from PMLN in, a, in you know, a large number of seats, 15, 20, whatever. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical of that kind of argument because we simply don't know the substitution coefficients of what those voters would have done if the, if the TLP wasn't there. And that's very, very hard to figure out. So um, I'm not confident saying that they swung the election in a lot of these National Assembly seats. What we do know is that they're gaining some traction in terms of vote share, um, in particular locales that are quite distinct from where the religious parties have had their strength um, over the last um, 20 years or so. One other thing I would say on this point is that if you look at elections, at least having some programmatic dimension, which is to say people don't simply vote for people for clientelist patronage reasons. If people actually care about policy on issues of Islam and, and politics, then um, the rise of the, the TLP makes some sense because the MMA was no longer on the frontier. Its policy ideas had become sort of stale. It also perhaps explains why within the MMA, the JOIF continues to do better than the Jamaat Islami because the Jamaat Islami is a very programmatic party. They're very ideological. They they are defined by their ideas, they're really invested in their ideas, they care about their ideas. The JUIF has a programmatic element to what they do, they're ideological, but they also exist to, as a patronage network to protect the, the madrasas, and increasingly as a network to help tribal leaders in the tribal areas protect some of their old prerogatives. The JUIF has been on the forefront of opposing the changes to the tribal areas. So it, it would make sense in this rubric that the JUIF has done somewhat better than the Jamaat Islami in this new competitive policy horizon. My fourth and final point um, is simply to remind all of us that electoral losers can still be policy winners. Uh, this, is, this is important to remember when you're looking at parties that do not sweep the electoral table, and none of these religious parties did. Uh, the MMA did not, uh, didn't do very well in this election, but since 2002, they have arguably played a role, and you could look at a number of occasions, in which they have shifted the policy debate to the right. Th uh, they are in part the reason that they're no longer very interesting, because they have moved the debate such that the mainstream parties, the PTI, has taken on a lot of their policy discourse space and agenda. Agenda. The TLP, as the new set of policy entrepreneurs, are arguably positioned to, to do the same thing now on domestic policy related to blasphemy and on, on some aspects of, of foreign policy. They might also, we don't have a lot of survey data to look at this, um, be positioned to shape the discourse on vi vigilantism because they have been very pro-vigilantism on issues related to blasphemy. So I think in, in that sense, they're, they're on that um, horizon. The second example in which losers can still be policy winners, um, the sectarian anti-Shia groups like Sifa Sahaba and their, their party, uh, the Rahi Haq party, did very poorly, but they still have a lot of ties to uh, the mainstream parties and they supported the PTI on balance in this election. Um, and the final thing to remember on this front is that uh, politicians and thugs often get along really well because there's a mutual thing that can happen between politicians and thugs. Politicians can find thugs useful because a little muscle goes a long way. Thugs can find politicians useful because when you, you need protection, you really need some sort of uh, person you can go to who can, can get you out of jail or make that FIR go away or whatever. And so in, in this environment, we should remember that 
uh, the accrual by these parties, these religious parties, of political standing and influence at the local level, even if they lose, the, the fact that they're out there campaigning, that they become known to the bureaucracy, that they have, they gain some some social capital, can help create networks of protection for the violent actors who, with whom they're in a patronage, a mutually beneficial patronage relationship. We see this again and again. I've looked at it with the JUIF and the, the pro-Taliban groups, but I think with the TLP and, and some other groups, it, it's also relevant, and for that reason, uh, it's a great time to be looking at how these parties did at a granular local level to see who they might be protecting and how they might be rising um, in that context. Thanks. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, and now we'll talk to uh, turn to Sahar to discuss uh, military. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and thank you to um, USIP for the opportunity. Um, so, I think um, most of you know that you know the military for this election was accused by politicians, human rights activists, you know, um, the media, et cetera, international and abroad, of, of interfering in the general elections. Um, and essentially, in this particular election, they interfered in two ways. Um, the first one was sort of targeting um, the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz group, especially <laughs> Nawaz Sharif, which is something that Yasser also discussed um, in length um, on, in terms of the judiciary. Now, the Army and Nawaz Sharif have always had a tumultuous relationship. Um, when Nawaz Sharif was elected in 2013, this was his third time, and now he's in jail for corruption. Now, to be clear, Nawaz Sharif is corrupt, so this is not, you know, saying that he's not. But I think what's really interesting um, of why he's currently in jail is that the case that sort of led to his court-ruled ouster was brought by Imran Khan and, and army officials and due to their cooperation. Now, this is something that the army and um, Imran Khan both deny, but this has been heavily reported, um, especially in international media and in, in, in English uh, newspapers in Pakistan as well. Um, the second way that the military interfered in the 2018 elections um, was basically by putting pressure on the media. Now, Pakistan is, has always been a very dangerous place for journalists to operate. Over the past 15 years, 117 journalists have lost their lives, and only three um, have uh, only three Three of cases have, have gone to the courts for, for investigation. Um, even though the number of journalists deaths has decreased um, over the past few years, they still operate in a very contentious environment, and they don't have a lot of security. So that said, um, the, the Pakistani media, basically, especially, you know, on-the-ground journalists, are, are used to operating sort of, you know, in a stressful situation. Um, but, you know, Hamid Haroon, who's the chief executive of the, of the Dawn Media Group and also the president of the Al-Pakistan Newspaper Society, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post prior to the election in which he said that this time the interference in the media is different from past interference because the focus is the military wants to ensure that the media does not cover the central political issue facing Pakistan, which is the power struggle between the civilian leadership and the military establishment. Um, and actually, there are several examples of this. I mean, even before the election in April, Geo News, which is, is a large cable news network, was forced to be off the air because they were seeming to be more pro Nawaz Sharif. It was only direct negotiations between Geo officials and army officials that led to them getting back on the air. Dawn newspaper has complained of their distributors being harassed by army officials, and they've seen an impact, on, in, especially in various rural areas, of their. Um, newspapers being um, not not being distributed as, as they should be. But, um, you know, the, the military interfering in the media is not just a 2018 thing. This has been going on for several years now. Um, and for those of you who especially do follow the military, um, it almost seems redundant to say that the military interferes because they interfere in almost everything related to Pakistan. But um, the example I like to give that showcases how the military has been going after the media is the case of the article that Cyril Almeida wrote in October 2000. 2016. Now, this was an article. Um, he's a very well-known, well-regarded journalist and columnist of Dawn. And in this news story, um, he reported that there was a meeting between civilian leaders 
and the military leadership under the um, Nawaz Sharif administration. Um, and when they were talking about curbing militancy in Pakistan, um, Shahbaz Sharif, who was the chief minister of Punjab at the time, you know, expressed almost an annoyance or really a concern. Um, and he told the military that any time that the civilian law enforcement organizations arrest certain members of certain militant groups, the army forces them to free them. Um, and this is something that's really bad for Pakistan domestically, for domestic political stability, and it also harms Pakistan's international reputation. Now, when this story broke, um, Everybody who was in the meeting basically denied it, denied it, right? But it was the military that basically went to Don and wanted to uh, wanted them to retract the story. Don, which I think did a good thing, and they basically refused, which ended up, you know, with Cyril Almeida on the exit control list for a few weeks. He's he's been off of it since. But the reason why I give this example is because it shows a very good example of sort of the military's hysteria surrounded by their image. Over the past few years, they have been very carefully. Um, uh, constructing discourse, constructing their image as, as a savior of Pakistan and as a protector um, of its territory and of its national identity. Um, and that, and so that was sort of the 2018 election showcase of, of how the military has interfered in the media. Now, the bigger question, I think, always is, why does Pakistan's military interfere in the political system? Mainly, I mean, I think it's because it, it can, um, and it also, it, it wants to, because over the past 71 years, it, Pakistan has experienced four military coups. Now, this has put the military in a unique position where it has slowly been able to gain um, political power and economic power as well. Um, and so now, after 71 years, the military is sort of invested in the economy, is invested in the, in the political society, and it's a power they don't want to let go. Now, what do I, what do I mean by their economically powerful? Powerful. Um, so the Pakistani army, right, owns farms, plastic factories, security guard companies, vocational training centers, right? The army. Um, the Fauji Foundation is one of the largest conglomerates in Pakistan, which is also owned by the army, and is heavily involved in agriculture, particularly in the fertilizer um, sector. They also make cereal and cheese, which is delicious, but you know, they shouldn't, I think, not be making cheese. Um, <laughs> the Army Welfare Trust, um, you know, owns commercial, which is also owned by the um, Army. Um, they own commercial banks, fish farms, sugar and rice mills, and pharmaceutical companies. Now, the Army is not the only part of the military establishment that's involved in this. So the Air Force owns, the Shaheen Foundation is owned by the Air Force and the Beria Foundation is owned by the Navy. Both foundations are heavily involved in real estate and, and also in, in various sectors of the economy. So. Um, basically, in, in 2007, which is dated, but just to give you an example of this, in 2007, 23% of the assets of the corporate sector were owned by the Fauji Foundation and the Army Welfare Trust. Now, that number may have shifted somewhat over time, but I think it's important to note two things. First, of course, the Fauji Foundation and the Army Welfare Trust are not the only ones that are operating in the agricultural sector. There are a lot of non-military um, corporations like um, the Fatma Group and Engro that also operate. But I think what makes this interesting is the opaqueness surrounded by the companies owned by the trust and the foundation, which makes researching just the, the reach that the military has in various sectors of the economy very difficult to determine. Now, in addition to being heavily involved in the economy, um, the military establishment is, is also, domi it also dominates national security and, and foreign policy of, of Pakistan. Now, one prime example of this is sort of the use um, and sponsorship of militant groups over over the several over several years, especially militant groups operating in Indian administered Kashmir and in Afghanistan. Now, it is important to understand that Pakistan's military's use of militants is um, has a long history, and Pakistan is not the only country to use non-state violent actors for political gain. Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United States, there are various countries who have used militant groups as proxies. So Pakistan's not alone or unique. Um, also, the military's capacity for sponsoring militant groups was bolstered by the United States during the Cold War, when the CIA colluded with the ISI to form the Afghanistan on Mujahideen to fight the Soviets. So since the end of the Cold War and Zal Huck's death in 1988, the U.S. has tended to favor the military. They prefer working with military leaders because they are professional. Um, they have bureaucratic predictability. Um, and so, you know, they, they seem to be less corrupt than the civilian side. The corruption in Pakistan is very relative. Um, so 
you know, especially when it comes to counterterrorism, the U.S. side has, has, has wanted to work with the military. Um, one interesting tidbit, which um, when I found I thought was very interesting, was that on the way to attending um, Huck's funeral, General Huck's funeral, Secretary of State George, George Schultz, Under Secretary of State of Political Affairs Michael Armacost, and Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Richard Armitage and Charlie Wilson, a representative from Texas, they devised a U.S. strategy in which they basically decided that they would back the U.S. military and intelligence agencies and also provide rhetorical support to um, domestic developments and external affairs. I see some eyebrows being raised. I do have a citation I can talk about. Um, finally, and this is an issue that I've sort of extensively done research on um, in my dissertation and, and beyond, has been how the military has been using the judiciary as a cover. Um, so this goes back to 2014, when after the Army public school attack that claimed 130 children, um, and that was conducted by the uh, tehreek e taliban Pakistan, um, the Sharif uh, government and um, the Army Chief of Staff at the time, Rahil Sharif, got together to create a national action plan, which I think all of you are, are well aware of. Part of that national action plan was to create military courts. And these military courts basically determined that civilians who are charged with terrorism will be charged and um, will be tried in a, in a military court. Now, in the past, um, related to terrorism, in the past, the Supreme Court has always struck down military courts, military courts formed by both civilian leaders and military um, and military dictatorships. But in this case, the parliament passed an amendment called the 21st Amendment that basically took away the separation of powers between the judiciary, executive, and the legislative branch and said that this separation of power does not exist for those that have been charged with terrorism. What this basically means is that a non-military person, a civilian who's been charged with terrorism, is now subjected to court martial laws. And in this way, the military has sort of maintained control over who um, which jet black militants, um, you know, get, get tried and are, and are put in jail, um, which seems counterproductive when you think about if the military is in charge of sponsoring some groups, then, then why are they essentially um, responsible for um, putting some of these militants in, in jail? Um, now, what does this mean for Imran Khan? You know, this is Imran Khan's first time uh, as, as Prime Minister. Um, uh, at my time at Cato, a few people have always asked me, what do you think, how Imran Khan, what is his foreign policy? And I always tell them, I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball. I will say this, that his first victory speech, um, you know, he took a very reconciliatory tone. Um, you know, with regards to China, for example, he said that, you know, the China-Pakistan economic corridor has been good for Pakistan. It's elevated 700 million people out of poverty. This is, is different from the campaign rhetoric that he maintained, which was that, you know, CPEC is bad and, and Nawaz Sharif and the military both get, you know, kickbacks from it. So, uh, you know, and with Iran, he's expressed improving um, relations same with India, same with the United States. With Afghanistan, he even said that he would like open borders, similar to the EU. So his, his tone was, was um was, you know, about reconciling Pakistan's um, regional relationships. Now, what does this mean for the military, and what kind of connection does Imran Khan have with the military? This is unclear. So far, he's been very careful about not saying anything anti-military or really pro-military, which gives the impression that he doesn't want to step on, on their toes when it comes to national security and foreign policy, which is a realm that the military has wanted to maintain control in. Um, I would like to end with a, with a hopeful note, though. Um, while I tend to focus on on Pakistan's civil-military imbalance and um, its effect on the state's national security and, and counterterrorism efforts, I do remain cautiously optimistic. Um, this is the first time Imran Khan is ruling, and I think that, that even if he accomplishes 5 percent of what he says, that would be good for Pakistan. And, and you know, a stable Pakistan, I think, is in, is in everybody's interests. Um, and I hope that one day I'm speaking at a panel where we can talk about how Pakistan has overcome its civil-military imbalance and how, magically, the military is now under civilian rule. I don't think it will be anytime soon, but um, I do think we might be closer than we were, say, 20 years ago. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sahar. And finally, we will turn to Nilafer, who will be uh, giving us an overview of the election violence, both before and during the elections. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm very excited to be here among a truly wonderful group of Pakistan scholars. And I just wanted to echo Josh that it's really refreshing to be doing a deep dive into the elections. and examining what they might mean for the future of the country. So thanks, USIP, for hosting this event. So as the last presentation of the day, I'll be speaking about political and electoral violence. And I want to be clear at the outset 
that by this I mean both violence that occurs before and during the election with the intent of affecting the outcome of the election. But I also mean violence that is carried out by political and democratic actors, um, which might occur in the months or years preceding the elections. And this is important because if this violence is intended to shore up support for the parties, or if it helps um, increase the resource base of these political parties, then it's worth discussing um, in this context. And of course, um, exposure to violence can and does affect political behavior and voting behavior, and so I'll be discussing this as well. And then finally, I'll also focus on the role of political parties and politicians in inciting violence um, and engaging in hate-based rhetoric. My talk today is based both on qualitative fieldwork that I carried out in May and June of this year, so uh, prior to the elections, as well as a survey that was conducted by myself and Michelle Malik, who's a PhD candidate at Stanford and unfortunately wasn't able to be here today, and the survey was carried out among approximately 1,800 individuals in Karachi, a site of much political violence in the past. Um, it was carried out, again, just a month right before the election, so June 26th till July 24th of this year. So um, let's, just to give you a recap of the actual violence that took place this time around, um, the 2018 elections actually got off to a relatively peaceful start, and I was here at USIP in June, um, and we were actually talking amongst us that it had been um, relatively surprising, but good to see that the elections thus far hadn't seen the same type of violence that we saw in 2013. This continued to be the case, but just a few days afterwards, there was a very large suicide at attack in Balochistan province in Mastung, which took the life of approximately 150 people with another 200 individuals that were injured. So this is one of the deadliest attacks that has taken place in the country at all. And among those that was killed was an electoral candidate, Siraj Raisani, who's also the brother of the former chief minister of Balochistan province. And then earlier, we had seen that an Awami National Party ANP leader, Harun Balor, was killed in a suicide bombing during a party meeting in Peshawar. Um, a convoy of the religious political party, the Mutahed Majlis Amal, MMA, was also targeted, resulting in approximately, I think it was four people dead. So then the violence continued on election day itself. Um, at least 31 people were killed. Once again, the largest attack occurred in Balochistan, in Kuwaita. Um, and then we saw a number of local level brawls or um, incidents occur. So there were allegations, for example, that a PTI candidate um, for provincial assembly assaulted or beat up police officers. Um, there was also um, f reports that were filed by police in Banu, also in KP province, against a former KP chief minister for forcibly entering a women's polling station. So we had a number of incidents where party members and supporters were injured and engaged in local level um, incidents throughout the country. So in total, according to the Pakistan Institute for Peace Studies, approximately 230 people lost their lives and over 400 were injured in 22 reported incidents in July 2018. 13 of these um, hit political leaders and election-related targets directly. So what do we make of these figures? Well, of course, some level of election violence is common in Pakistani elections, um, and these numbers nowhere near reach the amount of violence that we saw in 2013. Um, they were also qualitatively different, so violence in 2013 disproportionately targeted secular political parties, particularly the ANP and the PPP, and they were carried out primarily by the Pakistan Taliban. So the same institution, the Pakistan Institute of Peace Studies, suggested that a total of 148 terrorist attacks were reported across Pakistan between January and May 2013. Um, so 148 compared to 22, and these targeted political leaders, workers, election candidates, et cetera. Um, but what's important to note, and I want to emphasize that this, that um, this election violence, so the number of electoral incidents that I'm talking about, I think underestimates and understates the intertwined nature of democratic politics and violence in the country. Um, so elections, election scholars across many developing countries in the world often distinguish between two types of violence related to elections. So the more obvious one is coercive violence, which targets opposition voters in an effort to uh, dampen opposition voter turnout or have voters vote in a particular way. And of course, also tar targeting opposition political leaders and political parties directly to prevent them from campaigning effectively, et cetera. But in addition to these more blatant types of violence, um, we have what's often referred to as persuasive or polarizing violence, which is meant to create fear of another, right? So the other 
and, and often it's based on identity cleavages or identity lines. And the purpose of this violence is to polarize constituencies by instigating intergroup conflict. So Stephen Wilkinson talks about what are called ethnic wedge issues and how parties seek to highlight these ethnic wedge issues in an effort to mobilize voters to vote for their co-ethnics versus other um, political parties. So this increases the salience of one's own ethnicity and um, brings voters to the group who's making an ethnic appeal. So this has been the case in Karachi for um, the last few decades where heightened ethnic relations certainly determine or are a key determinant of political behavior and voting decisions. This time around, because of the paramilitary rangers operation against Karachi, we saw a, um, a different dynamic, and I'll turn to that in a second. But what I do want to emphasize here is that we are seeing similar um, identity cleavages becoming salient when we look at what Josh talked about, so the increase and the increasing space that's being provided to groups like the Tehrik el Lebek, the Mili Muslim League, the Ahl Sunnat wal Jamaat, which is the anti-Shia party. So these elections certainly provided more space to these parties, allowing them to campaign freely. Um, and these campaigns were often on the basis of intolerance and inciting hatred, um, and in many cases, violence um, towards religious minorities. So the TLP is not, um, an armed group did not originate from an armed group. That's different from the Mili Muslim League, which is thought to be linked to the um, LET. But it hasn't shied away from the incitement of violence either. So in 2018, one of its members carried out an assassination attempt against a federal minister. And obviously, as Josh mentioned, its originating point ha was support for the murder of Salman Thasir. Um, in election rallies, as supporters have shouted, hang them, hang them, as a refrain to refer to blasphemers. So this is an important landscape of violence and politics that, um, pre, that was prevalent in Pakistan prior to the elections. Um, and so my colleague and I were interested in carrying out a survey to look at what the effects of exposure to violence are or can be on political behavior and what the effect of campaigning on identity lines might have on prejudice and relations between ethnic communities. So we chose Karachi as a site um, primarily because of a history of uh, identity-based conflict in Karachi. Um, so as I had started to indicate, this time around because of the campaign against the Motahed Akami movement, the last few years in Karachi we've seen relative levels of calm, certainly lower levels of violence. If you speak with a lot of people in Karachi, they'll agree that um, crime rates, violence rates have decreased. Um, I will say that Karachi also saw a significant decrease in election turnout. And so um, whatever people make of the Rangers operation, and I think we can all be excited about a decrease in violence, it's also important to note that this also was accompanied by a, a disenfranchisement of a certain segment of voters, right? So I think the statistics are 40% voter turnout in 2018 compared to 55% in 2013. Um, and I haven't been, had the time to do like a deep dive into the numbers, but I would guess that a large percentage of these are former MQM supporters um, and Mohajers. And I'm happy to talk about this more, it has to do with the splintering of the MQM as well as um, the boycott announced by Altaf Hussain. Um, so perhaps not a direct result of the Rangers operation, but certainly related to the Rangers operation. Okay, so then turning to our survey results. So um, we, as I mentioned, were interested in looking at the impact that exposure to violence has on political behavior. Um, and so we might expect that if someone is exposed to violence, they can have one of two possible reactions, right? So you may choose to disengage from the political process, or you might indeed um, engage further. Um, and either way, it may affect who you choose to vote for, your faith in the process overall, et cetera. So we, in our sample of 1,800 people in Karachi, um, we found that a relatively high number had some exposure to violence. So 32% of our sample said that um, they had either personally experienced violence, had a family member who, who was exposed to violence, or witnessed a violence attack themselves. So this sample we found did depict significant differences on political behavior um, and political views than the sample that was not exposed to violence. Um, so particularly, we found that those individuals who were exposed to violence were less likely to believe that the elections were free and fair, more likely to expect violence um, to take place during the elections, and also more likely to fear violence during the elections. However, these individuals were not less likely to turn out to vote, and they were actually significantly more likely to be interested in politics or state their interest in politics. 
But the picture becomes more bleak when you separate out who the respondents noted was the perpetrator of the violence. So obviously Karachi has criminal violence as well. It's often hard to distinguish political and criminal and ethnic violence in Karachi. But we asked um, individuals who they thought the perpetrators of the violent act to which they had been exposed were. And we found, again, higher numbers than I had expected personally. So among those who had personally experienced victimization, which was 340 people in our data set, 36% identified criminals, but another 15% identified militant groups, 13% identified political parties, and 14% identified police or security agencies. And this subset of people were less likely to vote, which is important because, and it's perhaps intuitive, that if you have, been, if you have faced violence carried out by political and so-called democratic actors, then you may feel yourself to be more um, disengaged from the political process. So what can we do with this from a policymaker perspective? Well, one approach which was implemented during the 2018 elections was to station rangers, again, the paramilitary force at polling stations. Um, however, our data shows that those exposed to violence were actually significantly less likely to think that the rangers at polling stations make elections more free or fair or more secure. So precisely those folk who are more likely to need security are also less likely to think that the type of security being provided is a good thing. So we need to think of alternatives. Um, and if you thought the police was an alternative, well, the rangers among overall our sample, 78% believe that the presence of the rangers would ensure a safe and secure election. Of course, this was lower for people who were exposed to violence, but overall only 34% felt that way about the police. So the police is uh, largely distrusted in Karachi. So I'm just gonna end by saying that this data is relevant to us because it, it makes um, the space that's provided to actors like the TLP and MML, ASWJ, et cetera, even more pressing because if we continue to provide space to, or to political parties that campaign on the basis of exclusion or um, incite hatred and violence and so on, then we may be uh, in for further disenfranchisement of minority rights. Um, or minority voters who realize that they um, may not want to partake in a process which they deem to be neither free nor fair nor secure and might be putting themselves at risk because of violence. Um, and also, um, I mean, I mentioned the TLP and all of these actors because they're the groups that have attracted a lot of attention, but, um, you know, the MQM is not gone. I think it is here to stay. It will be back. I'm pretty sure of that. So we also have to think about, without disenfranchising Mohajir voters further, how to think about um, ethnic politics and the violence that accompanies that. Thank you so much, Neelafer, and thank you to all our panelists. I think they've raised some very important issues and painted what is a very complex picture that, you know, outlines the context for these elections and going forward for politics. Um, we're going to open it up for discussion. I ask that everyone use the microphone so that folks on the webcast can hear you. Please state your name and affiliation and keep your questions brief. Um, and we'll take a couple of questions and then feel free to, um, you know, specify which panelist or panelists you'd like to answer. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Jumaida Siddiqui, USIP. Um, so one question for Josh. So by-elections, do you think mm -hmm. that the religious political parties are going to take advantage of the by-elections, especially, I don't know if there's been an analysis overlaying where they, people thought the vote was close and that they drew enough votes to come into second. Uh, but I'd be interested in your take on where the where religious political parties, especially TLP, could potentially gain further seats um, in the by-elections next month, I think they're scheduled for. Mm -hmm. And for Yasser on the judiciary, so I think you said 82,000, 8,200. 2000, that'd be a lot. Uh, tribunal cases uh, for, for the election. Uh, uh, has the changes in the election law, do you think that these me this means that these will be disposed much faster than we saw in 2013, or are they working under the same framework from 2013? My name is Muki Mahmoud, and I just wanted to add a few things to Sarah's thing, if it's okay. okay. Our military, sorry, Sahar, I'm sorry, did I, <coughs> okay, Sahar. I just wanted to add that our Pakistan army, they do make nice cakes as well, and it's under the banner of Wings Bakery. And secondly, they also 
rule the cantonment boards uh, in order to govern certain urban areas. Thirdly, they provide the military secretary to the prime minister, which accompanies him all the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, please. Um, so I've got a question for Yasser and Sahar, which is about institutional coherence. So um, it's sort of consensus that, you know, it's the weakness of parties as institutions uh, that creates, uh, you know, a relative imbalance with compared to strong institutions like the military. Now, I'm curious about the coherence of these as institutions uh, in, in making decisions about political uh, intervention. So, I mean, there have been military dictatorships where decision making is concentrated uh, in the hands of a single person, right? Like the extent to which they, uh, uh, you know, particularly, you know, dictators. So I'm, I'm interested in where you think, how you think institutional coherence plays into decision making. So for example, in the courts, like how is, you know, is it the Chief Justice versus the Supreme Court versus the Islamabad High Court versus the Lahore High Court? How is political uh, preferences aggregated within these institutions? Um, and similarly, like for example, you know, with the military, what extent are they um, aggregating uh, political opinion from the Jawan, right, the enlisted man upwards versus uh, playing, you know, versus considerations of the military's institutional popularity uh, with the public. And I'm really interested in, similarly, in the judiciary, right? Uh, are they paying attention? How do they reconcile the tensions between maintaining the judiciary's popularity uh, with the national public versus the political needs of the members of the judiciary? Um, and my question for Josh is um, about the nature of denominational diversity and voter appeal. Most of the, I tend not to think of them as Islamic parties, but rather denominational parties, because almost all, all of them represent a particular denomination. So to what extent do you see um, success, uh, or rather, at this time, what do you see as the most successful party in appealing across denominational uh, boundaries to voters, right? So, you know, for example, do you, uh, I'm, I'm curious even anecdotally the extent to which you see uh, Labaik's ability to attract non Borelvi voters by pushing, um, you know, Namusi Ras Alat or, you know, uh, or, or for example, uh, the Ali Sunnat Wal Jamaat's, uh, ability to attract non deobandi voters, um, or even the JUIs um, attempt to do the same. Thanks. Thanks. Could we get your name and information? Oh, sorry. I'm Johan. Um, I'm at the uh, School of Oriental and African Studies. I'm a PhD candidate. Thank Thanks. you. Um, it looks like we have four questions, two here, two there, so why don't we take uh, those first? <laughs> Thanks, those are both great questions. Uh, with respect to by-elections, which are like, are like special elections in the United States, off-cycle elections to fill a seat, uh, I, don't, I don't pay a lot of attention to them. Uh, in, you know, I think if a by-election happens before a general election, people will look at it as a harbinger of, of, the, of the national mood, usually improperly because uh, people tend to flood the zone and focus a lot of money and attention on, on an election whose particularities might not reflect the, the general electoral dynamics. Uh, and when there's a by-election after a general election, um, you know, parties are still gonna try to all flood the zone and gain advantage, but I think it's only really consequential when you have either a provincial or a national parliament that is in some kind of precarious balance in which a few seats could tip um, some sort of coalitional behavior. And I don't think that is gonna be true in this case. So it will be interesting, but I think it will really be interesting uh, at a very local level as to who's able to, um, you know, who's able to to bring a little bit more energy. Uh, but there's so much so much focus on those that I'm I'm very wary of extracting any um, extrapolating any any broad observations. Uh, the question about denominational parties, I tend not to see them as denominational. They, they they are denominational to the extent that they have an orientation, 
right? But they're not denominational um, to the extent that um, that they just recruit on that basis. I mean, the JUIF is Deobundi, but a lot of people in Pakistan are Deobundi. A lot of politicians are Deobundi. The JUIF is distinct, I think, uh, not just in its Deobundi tradition, but in the sort of social class, geographic domain, some of the history of who it brings into leadership and, and how. The Jamaat Islami would like to think that they are above denominational politics right, and um, denominational categories, and of course they're not. They're their own denominational of sorts, but they have recruited beyond that their peculiar non-denomination denomination over the years. You know, I think you could ask the question which which parties writ broad are best at uh, at capturing voters across these distinctions. Um, and you know, I haven't looked at the national data on this. I don't think it would be these small parties we're talking about. I don't think it would be the PPP. Um, uh, I don't know between the, the PMLN and the PTI kind of what those breakdowns are like because we don't have much data apart from very anecdotal data on people's musliks and their sort of broad, um, more narrow affiliations. But that's a very interesting research project to see to what extent uh, those breakdowns can be understood and to what extent their discourse tries to target certain groups which uh, we see more a little more clearly with the PPP and some of the you know crypto Shia rhetoric that they use in their rallies. There are ways to identify, I think, who they're targeting. It's a little less clear uh, with some of the other parties how they do that. Great, um, uh, Yasser and Sar, do you want to answer? I think there's a weakness of the institutional coherence question and then the judiciary sure. question as well. So I'll first address the election tribunal uh, question that you mentioned. I think, um, uh, so from what I understand, the, it doesn't bode well for these cases being decided quickly. First of all, they've appointed predominantly serving judges rather than retired judges. That means they have other responsibilities as well, and that often means there's going to be delays. Secondly, there's already been a delay of, I think, several weeks in appointing the judges to these tribunals. So the, the allotment of time that was given for deciding these cases has already been cut into, so they have a very easy excuse for extending the time. So I really think we're going to see delays in the way the election tribunals deal with these cases. Even though they've been given a, a fixed amount of time to decide them in, they'll be getting exemptions. And furthermore, what will be interesting after that is see is which decisions by those tribunals get appealed. How do the appeals go? Will there be some interesting selectivity in which appeals make it to the high courts and which don't? So um, I can imagine some big cases taking some time to get decided. And there are a lot of, uh, I think, so the figure I was saying was I think that over 80 NA seats upon which petitions have been accepted by the electoral election tribunal. So it's a pretty big group of national assembly seats upon which they're going to be you know, pushing for some um, sort of, uh, you know, taking on the challenges, so, yeah. Um, and as far as the institutional coherence question, so this is a really interesting question for me. Um, it's something I think about a lot, and I think it's important to make one distinction between the military and the judiciary on this, right? One of the ways institutional coherence is sort of built up is through the hierarchy of an institution in which you come, you're recruited, you're socialized, and you go up the ranks, right? And the military is a very much a careerist institute where you come from the bottom, you move up. The judiciary is not, right? The high court judges are primarily lawyers. They're lateral entries. Very few judges make it from the lower courts to the high court. Most of your Supreme Court it's almost exclusively judges from the bar, right? So these are mostly people who've come in much later in their careers from the legal community to the judgeship. So you don't have the same mechanism of institutional coherence, I think, at the, uh, that you find there as you find in the judiciary. And I think that um, what that means is, therefore, that the bar is really where you need to be looking to understand what are the ideas and norms that the judiciary is really um, acting upon. And to the question you asked about the interest that the court is most re um, responsive to, again, that's the bar. The, you know, through my research, uh, I found, like, this is the audience that judges care the most about. This is the audience that, you know, they interact with on a regular basis. They make or break the reputations of judges. And that's, I think, where one looks to understanding where the ideas and norms of the judiciary sort of form. But but what there also comes, and, and this also comes to a very interesting debate going on right now in the judiciary, because on the one hand, there is definitely support for the judicialization 
that the judiciary is carrying out within the bar for one obvious reason. It means more cases for them. It means more issues for them to stake a claim on and speak, you know, and be engaged with, right? Now, so, of course, there's a professional interest in why they would do this, but also it reflects this idea that the bar today has of being the vanguard of middle, of, pub, of the public interest, right? They are, then that's sort of, that's very much just been transmitted and translated into the judiciary's own agenda. Uh, but there's this, also this concern about centralization of authority. And the, now the bar is getting very skeptical of the fact that in taking on more issues than judicializing them, the courts are centralizing the authority by which they decide what issues should or should not be judicialized, and specifically the chief justice. So the chief justice's office now has authority like, you know, you, you wouldn't believe, right? It's picking up cases, it's picking up issues, it's, um, you know, deciding all, but it's coming from the chief justice's office. And what bar leaders are pointing out is that 184.3, the power in which they take on these cases, is not restricted to the chief justice. It is a power that's supposed to be exercised by the whole Supreme Court, yet the chief justice is almost exclusively exercising prerogative on this power. And what this is, one of the reasons is because there are some judges in the Supreme Court who don't agree with the way in which the Supreme, uh, if Sarkham Nassar is exercising and using this power. And they are being silenced or pushed out. Um, uh, Chief Justice Dost Muhammad Khan was one of the judges who got, um, you know, he didn't get, a, he didn't even go for a Supreme Court reference because he was, him and Saqman Nassar do not see eye to eye. Earlier on, the current Chief Election Commission, Justice Sardar Raza, he was also not happy with the way Iftikhar Chaudhary used this power. So there is dissent there. And What's important is where the bar is more free to openly express its dissent, it is dis showing and critiquing the, dissent, the way the Chief Justice is centralizing authority and calling for more rules to be created in the way in which the court exercises powers under 184.3. So the Sindh High Court bar, the Karachi bar, they are very much, there's been a lot of conversation and protests about the way, the way in which the Chief Justice is using his power. And he, he's suffering a lot of reputational problems in Sindh right now. But on Hadid in Punjab, where he seems to have very close relationships with the bar leadership, there's relative silence. But bar leaders I've talked to are like, internally they're questioning what's happening right now. It's just difficult to really express that dissent because he's using this power. Because also, again, the power of centralization of authority is the use of the contempt of court power, right? And he can use that against lawyers who speak out too openly against him to further increase his centralization of authority. But I think that's going to be the question coming up now. When will the centralization of authority by the Chief Justice stop? When will rules start being formed about how 184.3 is exercised? And I think that conversation probably is going to start in a big way once Sarkham Nassar steps down. Sorry, just to clarify, when you say the bar, do you mean it in a sort of a more, in a general sense of, uh, you know, lawyers who have the right to practice in the high courts, or do yes. you actually specifically mean the bar associations? So all the lawyers in the high courts are members of bar associations, right? That almost all of them have to be, and they, it's a very uh, powerful union. It's like a union, right, the, the bar association. So I guess what I meant is, like, do you mean, who's more powerful here, like the collective or the leadership of the bar associations, I guess? Okay, so that's, I think, I think that's a really interesting dynamic within, and that varies from bar association to bar association, but as they become bigger, I think the leadership gets stronger, right? Because the leadership is developing more mechanisms of patronage to coordinate the actions of the bar uh, in sort of uh, reflecting and pushing their agenda vis-a-vis -vis the courts and vis-a-vis -vis other political actors. And so I think you're seeing very powerful bar leaders starting to coordinate activities across all bar associations in the country. And um, that, that's something that's only started recently, but is increasingly, big. I think there is a lot of bar, you know, power at the bar at the leadership level, but one of the key ways in which it operates is its ability to get the rank and file behind them, right? And uh, so that's, that's what the lawyers movement was all about, right? We have this incredibly potent tool of bringing the rank and file behind us to challenge the uh, General Musharraf, and we can do it faster than anybody else can because they're already, all, you know, they're already very directly answerable to us, so across the country, right? It's a very quick national mobilization bar leaders can do. So I think I think as they grow bigger, the bar leaders get stronger. Yes, sorry, can I interrupt? Yeah. Ali Ahmad Yes. He raised it to the press. And the second one is Justice Yaya. Yes, Yaya Fridi. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Did you want to comment on that? Um, sure, really briefly about the institutional coherence of the military. I mean, I think over time, because the military has such a unique um, power, um, I think the military leadership has decided that it doesn't really need to do a coup in order to remain influential. Um, in the past, they would need to do a coup to be in power. Now, considering the 21st Amendment and sort of how their powers have increased in counterterrorism, when you think about how they're, we have, they, they've been censoring the media, um, even how some political parties—I mean, Nawaz Sharif essentially had gone after 
gone against the military when he wanted to reconcile with India and how, how that ended up for him. So I think the military very much um, is fine with almost this facade of civilian leadership, and, and behind the scenes, they want to maintain power over national security and, and foreign policy. Now, this is an image that they have also carefully created over the past several years. The ISPR, which is sort of the PR wing of the military, um, at least over the past seven, eight years, they have been carefully constructing this discourse of how the chief of army staff is really the savior of Pakistan's territory and national security. How Rahil Sharif, essentially, um, he was, um, I think, you know, personalities matter, too, of the chief of army staffs, right? I mean, uh, Barbez Kayani seemed to be a lot more quieter, um, and he wanted to sort of be behind the scenes. Rahil Sharif was very much okay with billboards, uh, you know, across the highway saying, I am the guy who will save everybody from, you know, from the, from India's threat. So I think that there's that. There's almost a, you know, uh, a, a unique consensus in the leadership that they don't need to do a coup. I think what's also interesting is, and this is a study I'd wanted to mention in my comments but had decided not to, was um, just recently there have been three scholars that have collected open source data on backgrounds, careers, and post-retirement activities of post-1971 Corps commanders and director generals of the ISI, which is the um, premier intelligence agency. And they found that while former corps commanders and director generals, they don't contest elections, they don't really join political parties, they all at some point join the government, and they very much are, are you know, take really big positions in, in state-owned um, institutions and military-run corporations. And, and because of the Pakistani military is a professional military. It has bureaucratic predictability. And so because of that mindset, um, and when they enter sort of the public and private sphere, um, they very much maintain control over civil institutions as well. And so I think the way the military's power, it's very hard. A lot of it is sort of behind the scenes power. It's something you have to observe the trends of. Um, and of course, I would I would argue a lot of you know anybody at ISPR would say no 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 we never wanted to do a coup in the first place every coup that's happened has been because of necessity so I think with the military it's harder to understand the institutional coherence that exists but it does exist a lot more than say the judiciary or any other institution. Thank you. Um, I think we have one question here. Did you s go ahead? Hi, um, <clears throat> Aram Heather over at Georgetown. You know, um, I was just, um, Nilo, for your, in, your comments, I wanted to kind of turn this to um, the ethnic and violence sort of part of this, because my earlier comment was kind of optimistic, and now I'm back into pessimism. Um, you're right, the military is operating in the background. It's found that, you know, that's a much more powerful position. I'm also finding it really hard to reconcile the kinds of assassinations we've seen. We've seen the assassination of Siraj Raisani, as you brought up, who was part of the Balochistan uh, Awami Party, which was allegedly pro-establishment. And you've seen the assassination of Harun Bilor, who comes from a long line of mm -hmm. kind of an mildly anti-establishment, but most importantly, anti-Taliban. And you're also seeing the decimation of Mohajir and, to some extent, um, Sindhi leadership in Sindh, in Karachi. What does this mean for the future of the ethnicities the, or ethnic parties the way we thought about them in the 80s and 90s? Because there was still this idea that somebody like the MQM could be both secular and be ethnically sort of driven. Same with the ANP, right? And these are on the back foot now because of these two seemingly you know, un the forces that should not really be working in the same direction, but they are, which is the Pakistan military and the Pakistan Taliban, right? They're both being sort of squashed in between these two. And then the next question is, what about the emergent Pashtun leadership? Things like the, uh, the Pashtun Tahafuz movement that is just coming up. Mohsin Dawar and Ali Wazir win in Waziristan in, uh, in, in a way that, you know, we not only did we know that they had huge groundswell support because of the movement, but we didn't know if they'd make it out alive, right? And we still don't know what the future of their security is, given that the judiciary is now pulling back security for politicians. What would persuade the army to take more of an interest in the security of political leadership? This is a real issue. We are losing people who have um, a base in society. Can we really see this, go, you know, Pakistan moving ahead democratically if politicians are not allowed to just basically like exist, right? So I wonder what, how you would sort of tie that into the kind of ethnic map or the ethnic story that we have of Pakistani democracy. Thank you. I am Andrew. 
Yeah, Andrew Wilder, USIP. Again, thanks for another great set of presentations. Um, a question for Josh. Uh, when I was doing my research, again, many decades ago, um, focusing on the Punjab, you know, the conclusion uh, for me was one of the, you know, most important factors of forming, influencing voting behavior was the perception of who's going to win. And so for that reason, I often cautioned against determining the popularity of religious parties based on their voting behavior, because in the first-past-the-post system, they were never perceived to win, so why waste your vote for them? And I gave the example of Liaquat Baluch, who was then the Naib Amir of Jamaat Islami. In 1988, I think he won, re contested from an urban constituency of Lahore, and maybe won eight or 9,000 votes, uh, didn't win the seat. Um, the next year, in 1990, on the IGI coalition, when viewed to be military-backed, not just viewed to be, but was military-backed, and so the perception was it was going to do well, he got 90,000 votes and won the seat. Um, and so I guess to what it, that was back then, I'm sort of wondering now, do you think those same dynamics are at play? And so is, again, the religious parties also one factor why they aren't doing terribly well, because they're not expected to win. Um, and if they were part of a coalition, say, like it was MMA, um, would you see them perform better? Um, I think we'll take two more first here at the table and then ask them in the back. Go ahead. Um, Sherry Arfazli, formerly of the International Crisis Group, uh, currently unaffiliated. Uh, my question is for Yasir. Uh, I appreciate and agree with your uh, uh, observation about the judiciary's audience and who they're playing to, uh, but that said, the restoration of the judiciary's credibility as an institution began with the missing person issue uh, in the late year, in the final years of the Musharraf regime. And I uh, agree that um, they're trying not to take on the military establishment that is usually the one disappearing these people. Um, so it certainly lost a lot of momentum uh, since then. But a couple of notable things happened in the run up to the election. One is the Pashtun Tahafas movement that Iram just uh, referred to that brought missing persons back to so the central uh, to the center of the national conversation secondly related to that we've seen reforms to fata where part of that is the judiciary the extension of the judiciary's jurisdiction to fata so my question is just what with with these developments is there a prospect that will come full circle uh, and the judiciary will come back to those um, you know the, the issue of fundamental rights and if not, what will it take? Yeah, if you can uh, come up to a mic, that would be great, so folks can hear you. Hi, guys. Thanks for the great panel. I have a question for each of you. Uh, so for Yasser and... And if you can state your name and affiliation, Sorry, I'm Essen Bart. I teach at GMU, George Mason. Uh, my question for Yasser and Sahar is, how much coordination do you think there was between the judiciary and the army before the election? Uh, I have two questions for Josh, one following on Johan's great question, uh, maybe asked in a different way. Is there a place for a non-denominational religious party in Pakistan's electoral future? Because an alternative theory to the data that you presented, which is like the TLP is rising, the JUI is elbowing JI out of, you know, the MMA, is that y you've got to be a denominational party to get votes, and you can't be sort of one of these overarching JI types. So is there a future for a JI type party? Uh, and sort of secondarily, why, in your opinion, is there no Shia party in Pakistan? Uh, and then for Nilofa, uh, uh, specifically on the MQM in Karachi, uh, so obviously it, you know the MQM was sort of you know pretty hurt in the twenty in the most recent elections, and I'd maybe I want your thoughts on sort of three different theories of why that happened. One is uh, uh, sort of the splintering at the at the top level, right? Like one is this violence story that you're talking about, the unit unit in charge, sector in charge, the sort of muscle, the ranger argument, and then one argument is this sort of TLP picking up voters from this side and PTI picking up voters from this side. And so between those three arguments, which would, if any, which one, do you, which one would you favor? Okay, thank you very much. I think we have a, a rich list of questions here for all of you. So um, why don't we start at the top here with uh, the ethnic violence and um, the ethnic parties question, Nilofer. Sure. 
All right. Um, those were a series of really interesting and important observations. Um, so I have some thoughts. I don't know if they'll answer your question exactly, but um, first is I just think it's interesting that there's nothing like new actors like the TLP and ASWJ for us to start to become a bit sympathetic to the old actors like the JI and MQM, et cetera. <laughs> so not to, again, come across as like too much of a sympathizer of the MQM. I mean, it's very much responsible for a lot of violence in Karachi, et cetera. But I do think that it's important um, to pick up on this point that you made, Aaron, that like a lot of parties are facing two sets and streams of attacks from the military and from militant groups. And so these don't always overlap, and sometimes they do. And um, I think that we, all of us Pakistani commentators and people who, who follow Pakistan are really fascinated by the rise of the TLP and also with how the TLP is now responding, like the fact that it continued the street protests, et cetera. And so one question I think that comes up, or I've heard people ask, is you know what is the relationship here between the military and the role that the groups like this are playing as spoilers, maybe in line with the military's objectives, and uh, in some cases it seems like there's obviously like independent objectives and priorities, etc. Um, so I'm not I'm not to say that like you know these identity cleavages are replacing ethnic politics, and I think that ethnic violence in Karachi has been so deadly. So in our survey, um, we were trying one of the that we were exploring two questions, and I should have mentioned that this was generously funded by USIP, so <laughs> thanks for that. But um, So aside from exposure to violence, we were looking to see if there were any interventions that could try and decrease prejudice between ethnic groups. And um, the sad answer, because political scientists like to see results, is that it's really hard to diminish prejudice between ethnic groups, and the baseline levels of intolerance between groups is so incredibly high. Um, and it's really hard, again, like our work wasn't trying to disentangle the direction of the causal arrow, so whether or not political parties are creating this hatred or whether political parties are reflecting this hatred, but as in, in most situations, it's probably a little bit of both, right? So um, all of that to say that um, I think that ethnic politics as it has occurred under the MQM and a little bit the ANP, et cetera, um, it wasn't a successful story in the 90s, but it did um, fulfill a lot of needs of a very important group of people, and those needs exist. And the Mohajers being unrepresented, which is currently not all of them, of course, because a lot went to PTA, et cetera, but for those who are feel like they are unrepresented, and I really do think that the lack or the decrease in voter turnout is something that we should be concerned with, right? And so going forward, we need to think about what the replacement for this is. And um, I met an MQM member, um, and subsequently after meeting him, I also met an intelligence officer who apparently was concerned with my meeting with the MQM, <laughs> so, but that's another story. But the MQM official was telling me that, um, you know, for now, their plan is to lay low, and I think um, knowing MQM and how politically savvy it has been in the past, um, it's likely to, and already what it's done post-elections, you know, it's going to, it's going to return. Um, and what form that takes, I guess we'll have to see. Um, so that goes into Essen's question. Um, I think um, I think it's going to end up being an atypical election for the MQM. Um, I think we keep expecting to see the demise or the end of Altaf Hussain. I don't think we're really at that point where we're going to see it just yet. So, you know, his call for boycott did have an effect. Um, I, I think um, Zia Rahman, who's a journalist I respect a lot, wrote this awesome article about um, the end of ethnic politics in Karachi mm -hmm. because of the role of the PTI in winning votes. I don't see that either. I just I think there was something that happened that was a result of a lot of factors like delimitation, the new census, um, uh, obviously what happened with the MQM, the fact that they didn't have a headquarters to work with, and where is the ANP, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think we're going to kind of just like come back to some sort of parity, um, and I think we're gonna, it's gonna be more fractured, but um, I don't think it's going to be a continuation of the end of the MQM and the rise of the PTI or TLP or anything. Uh, Neil, Nilifer, did you have anything to say about the Pashtun, the Hafez movement and security of political leaders? Oh, um, that's a, yeah, I didn't write that down. Um, I don't really have too much to say on that point. I think um, it's, in, it's just, um, Again, I think just going back to this point of facing um, two 
streams of attacks from both the military and the militants. And with the PTM in particular, I think this comes out a lot because it's been a very unpopular movement among the establishment and the powers that be. Um, and so it's, I think, really refreshing to see um, its supporters win the seats that you mentioned. Um, so we'll see. Again, I, the survey that we carried out in Karachi showed that a large percentage of people didn't know who the PTM were. And I do, I think this comes back to this question of whether or not it's, I don't believe that it's a social media phenomenon. I think that's overstating it. But I also think perhaps the social media folk in this room have also overstated its grassroots level mm -hmm. importance, and especially in large swaths of the country. Yeah. So we should see how that ends up. Thank you. Um, Josh, I think there are two questions for you. One on how perceptions of who will win influence religious parties and then the place for non-denominational mm -hmm. religious parties or why yep. there isn't a Shia party. <clears throat> Thanks. And I just want to say uh, something very briefly about the ANP. Uh, it's very sad to see how they've been targeted, but they've been targeted for quite some time. And I tend to see their dysfunction as, in more pedestrian terms. Uh, they've had, you know, decades of infighting. Their last season of governance wasn't uh, perhaps the best. Um, and they have struggled to figure out how to deal with the, the new Pashtun nationalism and their place vis-a-vis the Tapas movement and others. So in many ways, they're, you know, it's very cyclical with their success and their prominence in the frontier, and we're, we're certainly in a down cycle. Um, you know, Andrew's question just reminds me of how much we don't know about voting behavior. Uh, but I do think there's a lot of sort of anecdotal evidence that people do want to vote for winners, and in patronage environments, there's certainly a demand for that. Um, and I think maybe a, a corollary to the anecdotal observation would be that uh, people want to vote for winners, and if they think that the army or some other establishment actor is trying to to push out an uh, incumbent organization um, and is trying to use a small factional or religious party to do so, people can often get a whiff of that, right? And so there's a, a bit of that in, um, in 2002 with the MMA, um, and I could imagine that as a future in a very localized way for the TLP. People get a sense that, you know, because there have been uh, clear examples where the military has publicly patronized the TLP um, and could see them as a tool for sort of wedge politics. But uh, again, there's just a lot we don't know about why people vote the way we do. Uh, to essence, two really good, good questions. Uh, it's hard for me in the near term to imagine a non-denominational religious party in part because the mainstream parties have taken over so much of the space, the ideological space that parties like the Jamaat Islami uh, had long occupied. The Jamaat Islami cares about law, the legalization, uh, Islamization of the legal system and institutions. And a lot of that has been, that space has been captured. Um, so a party could conceivably be in that same vein, but much more dramatic, uh, put forward some policy proposals that were more of a stretch and recapture that frontier. Um, but I, I think if anyone's going to be creative in that space, it's probably going to be one of the, you know, now we have three large quote, national parties, even though not all of them are really national. It's more likely one of those parties will see a, a sort of opportunity space in capturing that frontier uh, than a party like the JI. To the question of a Shia party, uh, you know, I haven't looked at this in detail, but I would imagine sort of um, if I were a, a Shia voter, I would see the benefits of continuing to vote for the PPP to outweigh the benefits of voting for a Shia party in most cases, because you can try to get the same degree of protection that you would voting for a Shia party, but without the risk of retribution. And there are several kinds of retribution. One is that the person you vote into power in a Shia party just gets hit by the Sipa Sahaba or somebody else, um, or that you'd rather be a crypto Shia than a public Shia. Uh, member of the Shia Collective, and so um, you don't want to signal your own sectarian affiliation in the electoral process, uh, and so you vote for a party that s says all the right things, gives all the right signals, has some of that rhetoric at the rally, you know will protect you to the extent that they can, but you don't identify yourselves in a way that makes you vulnerable. So that would be my my guess as to why we've seen that kind of voting behavior, um, and I could, we could think, talk more about what would it take to change that kind of voting behavior. Yeah, I, I, I met with them. I'm uh, aware of their operations, and they have done 
very poorly in almost all their electoral contests and haven't been able to capture a mass base of the community that they've been trying to recruit from. In part, if you talk to the, some of the voting population, uh, which I have, you know, only in, at times and in certain places, they provide this logic of the, the risks inherent in voting for a sectarian party, if you're a minority, uh, seem in their mind to outweigh the benefits of doing so, if you can gain some measure of, uh, of identification and protection from a larger political bloc. Thanks, and I think um, we're running out of time, so the, uh, I think it's fitting that the last question uh, Yasser and Sahar can answer is about coordination between the judiciary and the military. <laughs> I, I just would like to address the missing persons question quickly also, yeah, uh, just because I think they, they tie in, you know, there's clearly a, a question about the military and what the judiciary's relationship is with that, the institution. And I think the missing person issue, so to the short answer, I do think it'll come full circle. The court will deal with it again. But just as before, when the court dealt with it with very little actual, like, result, I think we would see a similar sort of cosmetic uh, engagement with the issue repeat itself. And the reason is because the courts always want to be the one institution that cares about missing persons. It's, it's an important claim for its post-2007 legitimacy, that we're the only ones who took up this banner more than anybody else. We set up the commission. If the card show, they went out to back for missing persons issues. And so, you know, I think that issue will continue to hold for them. I mean, you know, and I think they will want that status to remain and that reputation to be maintained. But when they will pick up the issue more or less, in the post-Army public school period, this last three years, it just wasn't something that the courts felt, it just wasn't something the courts would feel would be very popular with the groups whose, you know, popularity they cared about. Even bar associations I talked to, leaders said, we oppose, for example, the actions taken in the National Action Plan and the military courts, but we actually didn't oppose them. We knew we had to say we opposed them, but we really didn't. And there was this understanding that really, at this point, there was a consensus within the legal community also behind the secure, aggressive securitization. And in that kind of environment, we can't imagine that the courts are going to really push themselves too aggressively on this issue. But over time, that, you know, that, that's going to dissipate, possibly, and then we'll see the issue, you know, the courts pick up these cases where they challenge military security more than maybe they did before. But again, I think it'll at best be cosmetic, because it's always just been at best cosmetic. Yeah. That's why I just mentioned the PTM, because I think that is the new sure. factor that's revived attention. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how durable and sustainable the PTM is and what impact it has on Islamabad, right? Because, you know, things can happen in Karachi, but nobody can care. But, but Islamabad, the military right? released over 300 people because of the PTM, yeah, yeah, yeah. which 12 years of court hearings, I don't sure, think of this. Sure, I agree. And it'll be interesting to see what happens um, now, because, you know, like Javed Iqbal is the head of the Missing Persons and Enforced Disappearance Commission. And we know he is that because he's always been close with the military. But at the same time, when push came to shove in 2007, the military assumed they had his support, but he didn't sign the PCO, because at that time he realized it was strategically wiser to go against the military. So it really depends on when judges think based on what they want out of the system and what, where they're trying to get their reputation and strength from, or draw their strength from, how they'll deal with the missing persons cases at that time. So following Javed Iqbal's fluctuations on this issue is an interesting way to understand where the court's going to lean at what point, I think. Um, and finally about the question of the, uh, as Essen pointed out, the coordination. So, you know, we're outsiders sitting in, you know, Boston and DC, so there's only so much of the internal mechanics that one can uh, focus on, but I still, you know, would like to venture some thoughts on it, and I, I think that, First of all, I don't think the courts have acted as a cover or a proxy for the military, as some people would say. I think there's definitely an alignment of interests in taking on, you know, Nawaz Sharif and other institutions. That doesn't mean that one is reducible to a proxy of the other, right? But at the same time, I think where we see maybe coordination, and I guess it's speculative, is in the cases decided at the lower levels of the judiciary, so of, of, of the judicial system. So case, NAB cases, uh, anti-narcotics force cases, ANF cases. And the reason is that's not, should, that shouldn't be too unexpected because, you know, the military has a presence in NAB. The military has a presence in the ANF, right? So cases where, like, the ephedrine case coming up that came up against Hanif Abbasi or the NAB case against the Vashif, the Avonfield case and the other ones they're going to hear, I think it's reasonable to speculate that there is some coordination going on that come from the upper judiciary and the military, apply to those lower courts and how they deal with these cases. And there is space to imagine that the, that, that coordination would be happening, because both institutions have a direct influence on how these bureaucracies and the courts that are created by these bureaucracies deal with such cases. So I think that level one sees coordination on. Yeah, I agree with um, Yasser in part. I mean, I don't think that there's some sort of secret meeting going on between top-level judges and the military leadership. But, I mean, 
I don't think the judiciary is a proxy of the military, but I would disagree with the asset a little bit that I do think the military has strategically used the judiciary as a cover, which has allowed not only an alignment of interests, but to some extent some sort of coordination, which perhaps is sort of like a it's ac accidental coordination, not something that they sought. Um, and you see this especially in the realm of counterterrorism, when you've had law enforcement agencies and the military try to curb militant groups operating within the country um, that harm Pakistan's interests that, you know, secessionist movements, which you know a lot about. Um, and I, th I think that there's a lot more coordination. And, and, and you see this especially when you see um, so for my uh, research, I had um, read all the terrorism-related course law. It turns out it's a lot. And basically, um, some of the bureaucratic routines that the judiciary has developed has always been that when it comes to countering terrorism, they side with the military. And one way they do that is to say it's the doctrine of necessity, that under emergency we're going to um, let go of the separation of, of, of powers. Uh, and then, excuse me. And then also, I think what's interesting um, about the military and judiciary's relationship is that both institutions very much like to say that they are independent and that they want to each of them want to be, I think, to some extent, be the savior of, of the country. So the judiciary, even though we all know that it's extremely corrupt and that lawyers take bribes and judges take bribes, um, any judge I interviewed, um, and there were about 25 the, uh, judges and lawyers I interviewed for my research, they all said we're, ju the judiciary is independent, right? And, and they all talked about the military as being the two independent organizations and, and bureaucracies that want to work in Pakistan's interests. So I think that's also odd, too, how they both al also add advocate for each other. Um, and just very briefly about the PTM movement, right? It's Even though they PTM talked about the, the military going after them, the law enforcement agencies are very much part of this, too. And, and the police has been absolutely complicit in the military. Most of the dirty work of the military has been done by the police. Um, the police is very much interested in militarizing and being more like the military in order to curb um, various movements and not provide protection to the politicians. So I think to some extent whether or not the military will be — whether or not the military can be used to provide security for the politicians, I think we're, we, we see a turf war between the police and the military, which just exists sort of in general when you talk about domestic security versus um, international security in Pakistan. Thank you all so much for joining us. I think we had a, a really interesting discussion. And I'm pleased to join me in thanking all our great panelists here today.